At the end of June, the Federal Reserve released the results of their annual stress testing of the economy's largest banks. This year's results are of particular interest due to the rumblings in the economy and on Wall Street about the likelihood of a recession in the near future. Additionally, banks are under a magnifying lens of scrutiny after the banking sector was thrown into turmoil by the collapse of three mid-sized banks earlier this year. Today, I'm going to cover the Federal Reserve's stress tests in a few sections. First, briefly, what is a stress test? Second, what are this year's stress test scenarios? Third, the results from the stress test. And fourth, the gaps and trouble spots I see with the analysis complete and given our current economic situation. Okay, during the great financial crisis of 2008, Many banks were exposed to be systematically important to the greater economy. That is, they were too big to fail. If they were to fail, that would create major shockwaves for the rest of the system. Spooked by that knowledge, the US government bailed out the banks and the rest is history. After the underlying issues of the great financial crisis were exposed and the public outrage of the wealthy elite receiving governmental assistance to save them from their own bad business dealings, the US government decided that it would be a good idea to put further regulations on these big banks, with the idea being that they needed to be more closely monitored monitored for risky behaviors given the threats they pose to the greater economy around them. Enter the Dodd-Frank Act stress tests. Annually, the Federal Reserve runs economic model simulations with the bank's current business data and their own proposed bad economic scenarios, and the outcomes are then analyzed to see how well the banks are able to withstand the major economic disruptions playing out in the scenarios. The results are used for two main items. First, they're used to adjust the different regulatory and capital requirements for the banks to make sure they stay solvent under these dire economic scenarios. And secondly, the results of the annual stress test dictate how much capital the industry can return to shareholders via buybacks and dividends based off those capital requirements set earlier. For this year's stress test scenario, there were 23 large banks subject to the testing. This covers a lot of your larger players that must be tested each year. Think your JP Morgan Chases and your Wells Fargo's of the world. The severely adverse scenario is characterized by a severe global recession accompanied by a period of heightened stress in both commercial and residential real estate markets, as well as in corporate debt markets. Under this scenario, the U.S. unemployment rate rises to a peak of 10% in the third quarter of 2024. There is also a simulated sharp decline in economic activity accompanied by an increase in market volatility and collapse in asset prices, including a 38% decline in housing prices and a 40% decline in commercial real estate prices. There is an international portion of the scenario that features recessions in four countries or country blocks with heightened stress in those advanced economies. Additionally, banks with large trading operations are tested against a global market shock component that stresses their trading and private equity and other certain fair value market positions. Furthermore, banks with substantial trading operations are tested against the default of their largest trading counterparty. And for the first time this year, the Federal Reserve also did an additional exploratory market shock component, and this was applied only to U.S. global systematically important banks, GSIBs. That is a really sophisticated way of saying too big to fail banks. The exploratory market shock is characterized by a less severe recession with greater inflationary pressures induced by higher inflation expectations than the other scenario proposed earlier. The idea is that the differences in these scenarios could reveal different losses across banks depending on the positions they held in their portfolios. While the banks may find themselves in a state of stress, my hope is that you are in a state of enjoyment from watching this video. If so, please hit the like button and consider subscribing if you want to see more videos about economics and business in the future. Okay, getting to the stress test results, the 23 banks were able to maintain minimum capital levels despite seeing some massive projected losses for the group. The losses totaled $541 billion, which sounds staggering, 
and it is. The scenario is called the severely adverse scenario. Losses on loans made up 78% of the projected losses with most of the rest coming from trading losses at Wall Street firms. The rate of total loan losses varied considerably across the banks from a low of 1.3% at Charles Schwab to a 14.7% at Capital One. This makes sense. Each bank is going to have a different portfolio and a unique risk profile based on their business model. Credit cards were the biggest problem category of loans. The average loss rate for credit cards in the group was 17.4%, with the next worst average loss rate being commercial real estate at 8.8%. Among card lenders, Goldman Sachs and Capital One are particularly exposed with a 25% loss rate and 22% loss rate respectively. Credit cards being a problem makes a lot of sense to me. When a recession happens, you're going to have more people start to default and declare bankruptcy and credit cards are one of the first things to be wiped out when that happens. And commercial real estate being a problem also makes a lot of sense. If a recession happens, you will have businesses that shutter their doors. And as a result, they are no longer going to be occupying their space. And then commercial real estate developers that own that land may not be able to make payment on their loans, resulting in more defaults. Overall, the group saw their total capital levels drop from 12.4% to 10.1% during this hypothetical recession scenario. Each bank has a unique capital requirement and it varies from year to year based on these stress tests. You can see the requirements from late 2022 on the screen now. But in this scenario, none of the 23 banks fell below their capital requirement ratio. So that is a positive thing. Secondly, the capital level decline of 2.3% is in line with recent years testing, so there are no major alarms there. Lastly, looking at the aggregate trading losses for the 11 banks subject to those components of the stress testing, the total losses amounted to $94 billion. One of the big takeaways from the results this year is that big banks perform better than the regional and card-centric firms in the test. Firms like Capital One, Citigroup, and Citizens could see some of the larger increases in required capital levels after the latest round of testing. Lastly, what about the exploratory testing they did this year? Remember, the purpose of the exploratory market shock was to assess the potential of multiple scenarios to capture a wider array of risks. Well, here are the results from that test. Ultimately, the accumulated losses under that scenario were found to be quite similar to the other scenarios that the Federal Reserve runs. However, the underlying composition of losses did vary from the original testing. The Federal Reserve noted that the use of more than one scenario can expand the Federal Reserve's view of risk exposures and be prepared for a wider range of threats to the financial sector, which in my mind is a good thing. Okay, looking at the testing, clearing the stress tests is a good step, but it's not the all clear signal it's been in previous years. We have seen instability in the banking sector earlier this year, so they will still be under close watch for the foreseeable future. A big risk to banking that I see is the smaller banks, which are excluded from this Federal Reserve stress testing. The large banks tested only make up 20% of commercial real estate loans, which still leaves a lot of exposure to commercial real estate in these untested firms. We saw the large banks suffer an average real estate loss of 8.8% amounting to $65 billion. We don't know what the fate of the smaller banks would be if they suffer under similar conditions, but it would likely still depend on each bank's unique loan portfolio, those with exposure to a lot of commercial office space, hospitality, and retail space loans would be in a bad spot in an economic downturn, whereas others may not be. Smaller banks also have a greater risk of suffering a collapse under a bank run. This is what happened to Silicon Valley Bank and First Republic earlier this year. Large banks are not likely to suffer that fate due to the sheer size of their position. So that to me is the biggest kind of gap in the analysis and potential trouble spot for banking ahead.
We talked about the commercial real estate risks on this channel before. If you would like to check out my video on that, it is on the screen for you now. Thanks for watching and I will see you in the next video.